Welcome to our demonstration session on reading a quantitative article with the use of a checklist. Now this particular article fits in with our earlier topic of sugar sweetened drinks. It's a feasibility and impact study of placing water coolers in Dutch secondary school canteens to look at the effect that this will have on the consumption of sugar sweetened beverages. Now when we look at the um, checklist we can uh, see that uh, the questions we're going to um, be answering relate to three aspects that we mentioned in the introductory video to the module. Are the results of the trial valid? What are the results? And will the results help locally? So what we're going to be doing is moving between the article and the checklist in order to do some structured reading of the article. So um, when presented with the checklist we uh, move to the second page on which the questions begin. You'll notice that the first uh, questions are what are called screening questions and uh, familiar to you is the idea of a question being focused around a PICO, the population studied, the intervention given, the comparator given and the outcomes considered. And so the first thing we have to do from the article is establish whether there is a PICO. So in terms of the population, yes, we see that this is in Dutch secondary schools. In terms of the intervention, it's placing water coolers. In terms of the outcome, it's in terms of sales of sugar sweetened beverages. And as we look further in the article, we'll see that the comparison is between schools that have water coolers and those that do not. So we can clearly answer in response to this that there is a focused issue. Secondly, was the assignment of patients to treatments randomised? Well, we notice that there is no mention of randomisation in the title of the article, usually the first place that we look, and then as we move down to the abstract, we see that the methods involved not randomising, but dividing the schools into intervention and control schools. So immediately that gives us something to look out for. And in fact, as we um, progress through the article, we, we see that um, this uh, assignment was actually uh, not done at random. Uh, what they first of all did was that they um, approached uh, 15 schools, nine met inclusion criteria, uh, but some of these were not interested in participating, uh, uh, either because of confounding projects they're being involved in or because of an extra workload. So clearly this is not a randomised controlled trial and if uh, other evidence was available we may well decide not to include this particular study. Um, but um, in, in this instance we're going to uh, proceed. Um, this will very much depend on the amount of evidence available. So the third one, were all of the patients who entered the trial properly accounted for at its conclusion? Now obviously it's important that we can um, look out for missing data just in case uh, that might be misleading to the study. And in fact, if we look through the study, returning our attention to the methods section, we find that um, there was some missing data. For one of the schools, the data from the last intervention period was not available. Now what do we do if we face missing data? Well, we can make several assumptions. We can, uh, um, we, we can uh, impute missing data, perhaps um, carrying forward the uh, average result, we could carry forward the last reported result, or in fact we could take the worst case scenario to work against the direction that we're trying to demonstrate from the trial, because if there's still an effect, despite weighing against the direction of the trial, then it means that uh, we can be more confident that something is going on. Now we can decide how we're going to handle the missing data, but um, in this particular case we're asked um, whether patients are analysed in the groups to which they're randomised. Now 
in this instance it's not possible to um, randomize um, uh, school children because um, of course they could encounter um, colleagues who uh, use the same dining room and uh, therefore those in the control and intervention groups could uh, become contaminated. You'll notice here the is it worth continuing question. This gives us an opportunity to uh, um, uh, to bin the study if you like if we don't feel it's uh, um, performing at least minimally against these criteria. But for demonstration purposes we'll continue with this exercise. Next question, were patients, health workers and study personnel blind to treatments? What do you think here? Do you think it's possible to blind school children to the fact that there's a water cooler in their dining room? Wouldn't it become clear to the study personnel um, which uh, dining rooms had the water coolers and which didn't? So in this particular case, although our answer is no, um, it's not always possible to blind. And this is particularly the case with human mediated interventions like particular types of therapy. Were the groups similar at the start of the trial? Well this would have been one of the benefits of the um, method of randomization had we been able to uh, detect this um, because you want to start with what we call a level playing field and randomization achieves two groups that are um, equally matched against uh, important factors like age, sex and social class. And sure enough, when we look at the um, data, um, what we call the baseline data, typically it's either in uh, table one or in this case it's in tables one and two, um, we'll see that there are some quite pronounced differences between the consumption of drinks um, in the school, intervention schools and control schools, even at the beginning. Now, um, part of the impact of this, for example, we see that sports drinks, uh, 3.6 um, um, millilitres per pupil per day are being consumed in the intervention schools and half that in the control schools, means that there is a greater capacity to benefit from the intervention. And so the effect size, the maximum effect size in the control schools would, would be 1.8 if they completely eradicated sports drinks and the effect size in uh, uh, the intervention schools would be 3.6 so clearly the intervention schools have more potential to benefit. Going back to our checklist, uh, question 6 here, aside from the experimental intervention were the groups treated equally? Well we can answer um, yes here, um, they were uh, directly observed the same figures of consumption were being recorded for the intervention and the control group and so there is no cause for concern at least with regard to how the groups were treated. So all of those questions are based on the methods of the paper and as we move on to part B we move to the results. So what were the results of this particular study? Well um, what they observed was that um, uh, although there is a reduction in um, consumption of sugar sweetened beverages um, as depicted in table 3 that the sales of sugar sweetened beverages decreased in both the intervention schools and the controlled schools so rather than demonstrating that the intervention uh, worked we are actually seeing that something else was going on and in fact there seem to be seasonal differences that were similar in intervention and control schools, suggesting that there are other factors that have not been taken into account in this study. How precise was the estimate of the treatment effect? Uh, usually we would be looking for p-values and confidence intervals. Now the authors explain that because this was a feasibility study, if you like a pilot study, that they didn't um, uh, place uh, figures for precision, so we don't have that data available. And on to the final questions. Will the results help locally? Can the results be applied in our own context? Now we should not necessarily expect that for every question that we have that there will be a study that's been conducted in our local population. So part of your skill in this module will be applying studies from other populations to your own target population. 
So what we need to ask is, are the patients covered by the trial similar enough to the patients to whom we'll apply this? So with me being here in the UK, are UK school children similar enough to Dutch school children? Now um, we have to say that with this particular question the burden of tr proof is to try and argue against this so we would assume that uh, Dutch and English school children are similar unless we can state something that makes them different so um, otherwise uh, we wouldn't be able to apply research to our population unless it had come from the context in which we're planning to apply it. In terms of the important outcomes considered, other information that we would have liked to have seen, well in fact the authors themselves say that they had no way of controlling for other sources of soft drinks. So the children could have been drinking water while they were at school, but on their way home they could have popped into the local uh, supermarket and picked up sugar sweetened beverages. Indeed they could well have brought sugar sweetened beverages in from home. So um, we have to be wary that um, uh, there could be other explanations for their patterns of consumption. Are the benefits worth the harms and costs? Well in this particular case um, we find uh, that the uh, intervention is uh, uh, not likely to be uh, that costly. Um, however we also find that there is not that much likelihood of benefit. So um, this is probably not um, a paper that would form the uh, absolute basis for changing practice. Um, it certainly doesn't negate the value of water coolers as an approach to sugar sweetened drinks, but we might prefer to explore other options. So th this has been a very brief and uh, admittedly superficial um, demonstration of how you would use a checklist to uh, navigate your way around um, a, a study. Now it's also important to bring to your attention that a good study will very often highlight its own limitations and so in this particular study the authors um, highlight for example some of the advantages of their study and some of the limitations and some of the possible explanations for the findings that they uh, uh, derived. Um, so this is something that would be very useful for you to look out, typically in the discussion. So critical appraisal, a little bit in the introduction in terms of the aims, mostly on the methods in terms of whether it's been done well, then on the results to see whether it's something that we need to take account of, and then finally in the discussion with the limitations of the study. So um, thank you for your attention. I hope that you find this useful in, planning, in applying this to your own quantitative study and I'm very happy to answer questions at a.booth at sheffield.ac.uk.